sitting here. Uh, this is a session with no special planning because we hope that you're going to take part. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Danny Dresner. Uh, I usually say Dr. Danny Dresner. Uh, I'm Jewish, so you can't stop me speaking, but at least I've got a PhD, so I'm qualified to. Uh, highly qualified today also is our panel. Uh, we've got uh, Lee from m and I'll ask them all to introduce themselves uh, in a moment. Uh, Chris from Malwarebytes, who at great personal sacrifice thought it would be a little bit unbalanced and cliched if we all sat here, or the majority sat here of us being bearded gentlemen. So he actually shaved his off last night. So I think in terms of preparation, Chris gets the, uh, the prize, and we also have Paul from Sovos. Um, we're here about futures. Don't know where the, the way this conversation's going. A um, bit of an academic, a bit of a consultant, uh, chair or part uh, director of the IASME Small Business Program. So I see a lot of stuff that's out there. Uh, my way of seeing the future of cyber, and I mean cyber as in cybernetics, uh, cyber security, is, well, option one, we're all going to die. Well, I'm going to be right on that one sooner or later, aren't I? Uh, we could fail and let the bad guys win. We could just tread water and do no more than we're really doing at the moment. Or perhaps, perhaps, just perhaps, we can get to the stage where we have more trustworthy systems than untrustworthy systems. So that's my pitch. I'm supposed to be chairing and not taking over. So I've ditched the 50 PowerPoint slides. And I'll ask the panel to introduce themselves. Lee. Hello everyone. So my name is Lee Barney. I'm the head of, despite what it says up there, head of cybersecurity. And uh, we decided it's best to change the name and move with the times instead of going with information security, which is kind of the, the old way of thinking about it. I'm responsible for making sure MS stays secure in the 59 different territories that we operate in. Uh, we've got in the region of 850 stores just in the UK alone and 450 stores internationally, uh, distribution centers, sourcing offices, and 85,000 colleagues. Uh, in short, that's, that's quite a big estate to try and protect. And to try and protect that estate uh, from a retail perspective presents its own opportunities. Uh, that's me. Yeah, uh, my name is Chris Boyd. I'm uh, from Malwarebytes. I'm the blog team lead. Uh, we've got a team of about 11 or 12 bloggers. Uh, we invest a lot of money in the, the blog and getting information out on the latest research uh, in terms of malware, spyware, uh, potentially unwanted programs, exploits, ransomware, you, you name it, we're, we're generally out there uh, finding the later threats and you know, telling everybody about it uh, on the blog, in the press, at events like this. Um, and that's, that's basically what we do. And I'm Paul Ducklin. Uh, I don't have to look backwards because it actually reminds me who I am down here on this screen that you can't see. So I know who I am and I'll read it off there. I'm a senior technologist. If you find out what that means, please let me know, duck at sophos.com. Uh, I had my 21st anniversary with Sophos this year. I've worked in various parts of the world. Uh, my main role at the moment is writing for our Naked Security website. Some of you may be readers of it to try and engage with the community to get to that world where we have more trusted systems than untrusted systems, and where we, if you like, break with or get rid of the past that suits the bad guys so well. OK, well, I'll throw the questions open to the audience in a minute, but just to make sure that we don't break off without having any questions open, uh, let me just ask Lee. Um, now, I see this as a world where we are expected to trust an awful lot of things. Uh, I would actually like to see it become a world where people get as angry and vitriolic with the criminals who do the bad stuff uh, as they do with the various people who deliver the services uh, and even the people who deliver us the products who uh, run those services uh, for us. So looking at it the other way, and uh, we were talking about this before we came in, Lee, we have to trust one big brand. You've got to trust all of us little guys out there. How do you approach that? I don't think I should have sat in this chair because I'm going to get asked first every time, aren't I? Um, yeah, do you know what? You raise a really good point, actually. I mean, obviously, M&S trusts, trusts our customers. Uh, and hopefully, you will shop at M&S. And if you don't, I strongly encourage that you do because it's a fantastic shop with great food. Uh, the, the point you made about how when the bad guys do something wrong, 
the bridge role is chucked squarely at the person who provides the service. Let me put that to you in another way. Imagine somebody ram raided one of our stores and they got hold of a customer database, stole that customer database and ran it. Well, let's just say they did it into a data center. Quite clearly, the blame would be apportioned to the person that was driving that vehicle, who then went in ninja style and pulled the server and ran away with it and then did whatever they were going to do with it. If they did that same attack online, somehow that's my fault. How is that? And I find it quite interesting that the, the more recent breaches that have, that have happened in the industry, uh, and by industry, I mean anywhere where there's customer data that's been, been stolen, it tends to be the person that holds that data that's held to account. If you look at what happened with TalkTalk, Talk, where it's allegedly uh, been done by a 16-year-old child in, in Ireland, it's never been focused, certainly not from a press attention, at least not what I've seen, at, at the person that actually did it instead, or purported to have done it. Instead, it's focused on the person that ran the systems. Now, arguably, everybody has their part to play. Everybody has a responsibility to protect the data in line with the threats that that data faces. But I do think that the blame should be, certainly from a public perspective, or less of the blame, the focus should be on the person that did it rather than just the organization that happened to have a criminal act completed against them. I, can I just say, I, I agree with that, that there's the crook, and we mustn't forget he's a crook. He's not a clever guy. He's not some misunderstood hacker. There is a big difference, though. If someone ram raids your warehouse and steals your stuff, that's kind of your problem. And I bet your warehouses are well... I'm not picking on Mark Suspenser particularly. I mean, you, yeah, let's, you, let's not, you, okay. you plural, right? <laughs> and you probably have good protection, and you would be very upset with a security guard at the gate or whatever if someone were able to break into the warehouse and steal your stuff. The problem is, in many cases, Talk Talk being the classic UK example, we've got Target, we've got Home Depot, we've got Ashley Madison, the list goes on and on and on, is that the warehouse that was broken into didn't, in many cases, didn't require a RAM raid. It required, like, some guy in a Mr. Bean Mini coming up. And secondly, the stuff in that warehouse was mine and these guys. You, plural, collected it because it was in your commercial interest to do so, and then you lost it. So, although we have to blame the crook, that's very different from someone breaking into your warehouse and stealing your stock. And I think the sooner that organizations accept that this rampant, arrant collection of data, making us create online web accounts so we can buy a train ticket, for goodness sake, I had to do that to get from Oxford to Manchester, if you don't mind, create an account and share my stuff with no indication of how I could ever remove that account when I was finished the journey, I think people have a right to kind of point fingers at the crooks and at the people who collected the data in the first place. And, 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 and also, you know, in terms of uh, trust, I mean, I, I personally don't trust anything anymore. I mean, in terms of a show of hands, I mean, who, who runs an, an antivirus or security solution? Just quick show of hands. Okay, so most people. And then how many people run, uh, say, uh, an exploit blocker? Show of hands. Dedicated exploit, okay, so it's gone down. How many people run some form of script blocking in the, in the, the organization's browsers? Okay, so the numbers are going down. And then finally, how many people run ad blockers on the, the business corporate network? Oh, surprisingly, a couple, couple more than that. So, you know, the, there is a sliding scale there with everything for trust. I mean, any, the, the moment you haven't raised your hands for just one of those, those items, you're effectively inviting them in. And even, you know, even internally, uh, we have uh, checks and balances. We, I mean, I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, CFO fraud, business email compromise, where someone basically goes onto a website's portal, social media page, or their About Us page, uh, finds out who the CFO is or someone in HR, and then they, 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 they start sending emails pretending to be the, the CEO of the company. Uh, we've got this wire that needs sending. We need to send $40,000 to this place. Uh, and then the, the, the poor CFO ends up green lighting this money being sent off to Hong Kong. And then, you know, the next minute, the, the company's in the papers and they've lost $47 million. And that is an actual thing that happens because uh, companies just don't expect these attacks to come. Uh, you know, everyone's expecting this external attack. They, they have no idea about the internal threat that's going to that's gonna come down the pipeline. Um, so, you know, I, I don't personally trust anything, but there's, there's got to be a, some sort of verification uh, step in place, or you, you're going to end up one of these companies in the paper that's lost millions and millions of pounds because they just they see these this this deluge of emails coming from their supposed CEO. Have you done it yet? Have you done it yet? Have you done it yet? And then all your money has gone, and your company is is has gone bang with it. 
Can I just come back to the point that Chris raises? Oh, clearly, MS cares a lot about our customer data, and we, we do a lot to protect it. We spend a lot of money, and we, we take the best steps that we can to protect it against the threat that it faces. Let me take it away from uh, organizations that may or may not have been hacked, and let me just put it to you in, in, in very, very simple terms. In this country, if something is left unguarded and unprotected, it's on the criminal who stole it. It's not on the person who has that thing to protect it. So if a farmer leaves his tractor in a field and then somebody comes along, jumps over a fence, or even if there's no fence, just walks up to the tractor, hot wires and steals it, it's not the farmer's fault for leaving his property in his field. Now, I'm not saying that's directly attributable to customer data, because clearly your data is your data. And where the retailers have that data, it's on the responsibility is in part to protect that data on, is on the retailer. But there is an interesting move away from the expectation of stopping criminals from doing bad things onto the person that's aggregating that data. Now, clearly, in the case of a bank, where a bank has lots of money, it's on the bank who is entrusted with that money to protect that against the threats that it faces. But we shouldn't forget that it is the criminal that has committed the criminal act. And I think that's the kind of point that Danny was trying to raise and that I'm trying to suggest. I'm not saying that retailers in particular or any business should absolve itself of the responsibility that is placed upon it when you pass your data to us to protect it. But it's not the farmer's tractor in the farmer's field being nicked. It's like the farmer's offering a special save your tractor securely with me service and then he goes and leaves him in the field and someone nicks all of them. In fact, they don't nick them, they're just driving around in one with the same number plates and yours are still there. So I don't think that's a... I think that's a risky analogy. Yes, the crooks need to be bust and hats off anyone in law enforcement in this room. The cops are doing a much better job these days, particularly when you look at the multi-jurisdictional complexities. But I think it's very different leaving your tractor in your field than actively soliciting stuff from other people and then not looking after it, even in the most basic possible way. And then, when it comes to your data breach notification, saying, we were the victim of a sophisticated cyber attack. There are always these giant excuses. We wrote an article last, a colleague of mine wrote an article called What You Sound Like After a Data Breach. And it was meant to be a joke. It was meant to be sarcastic, well, tongue-in-cheek, about companies making statements about, you know, how, mu how, mu how seriously they take your data security. And when they say that, what they mostly mean is, we take your data security seriously now if only we'd done it last week or the week before. So I think there is, an, there is an element of responsibility that often seems to be ignored by people who, who suffer data breaches. It's kind of as though, well, yes, we know you're a, a victim of crime. That's a problem in its own right. But if you're doing this for your own commercial benefit, collecting all this data, then you kind of jolly well owe me to look after it properly. That's my opinion. I, I think I actually used two analogies. And one of them was the one with the tractor. I perhaps should have led the one that I used about the bank because I, I clearly recognize that customer data is very important. And you put your trust in the organizations. And yes, you cannot absolve your responsibility to protect it. I'm not suggesting for one second that any organization can absolve itself from the responsibility to protect the data that's entrusted to them. I'm simply pointing out that actually we cannot forget that the principal part of this is the criminal that has completed the act. And yes, that does not negate the need to protect the data. Okay, can, can I just take that one at this point? Because I think we, 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 can, we can tick the box because we've now covered the first uh, area of the international standard for governance, which is about sorting out uh, resp responsibilities. Uh, anybody from the security services here? Now, I wasn't really expecting you to put your hands up there, don't worry. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not as daft as I look. Um, but the interesting thing is, of course, uh, as how much we see in the news on this same subject about the poor people from the security services who are always getting it in the ear for what they're doing uh, and having to follow this law, that rule, and, and the like. Uh, and, of course, similarly, we don't hear uh, that much complaining about the people who cause them to have to do this sort of stuff. Uh, so, uh, good discussion there, something which uh, I imagine is going to uh, only end in three falls and a submission in the, uh, in the speaker's lounge. Can I open the, f the, uh, the questions up to the floor now? Yes, sir. There's a gentleman coming with a, uh, with a mic. One question I'd like to ask. Um, if I leave my car open yeah, and a thief comes along and steals it, I'm responsible for that. Data is, is an asset. It needs to be protected. Can I ask the panel, 
is there any scheme to ensure against this theft? Because at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's theft. As my car would be stolen by a thief, so can the data be stolen. I have an insurance policy against that. What insurance do you have in place? Uh, well, there's certainly cyber liability insurance. Anybody want to talk about cyber li liability insurance? I know it's becoming more and more popular. It's been around in the States for a while. I know that uh, businesses who go through cyber essentials uh, with some of the accreditation bodies will automatically, having shown that they've put their locks in place, uh, get uh, cyber liability insurance to help them recover. And of course, part of that recovery is all about uh, being able to uh, uh, soften the blow for the poor people who will be on the receiving end. I think, it, I think it's a great idea to be able to have insurance like that. Like, it, let's say, if you, have a, if you have some data disaster that affects my data, but I'm, I am a customer of yours, you know, I've got some, some kind of interest with you, I'd love you to be able to survive that data breach and make things better. But the real risk is it kind of can become an excuse that implies that you can make good afterwards. Now, if nobody's injured in a car accident, at cost, you can sort of make good because you can get another car that's kind of as good as or the same as the old one, maybe or at least close. The problem with what we call data theft is technically nothing was stolen. You weren't deprived of it. The problem is that somebody else has now got it and you can never get it back. And you know for sure it's for sale on the cyber underground somewhere. So as long as this whole idea of cyber insurance doesn't become a sort of a way of weaseling out of, I'm not saying that it will, but you know, it needs to be very careful that organizations don't use it as a way of saying, well, we'll underinvest in the future in actually stopping this happening in the first place. Because insurance isn't really about prevention, it's about making good if the worst happens, and that's all it can ever be with a data breach. Well, I mean, I, I, I used to work in insurance and we, we are a pretty big insurance firm and, you know, even just dealing with, with basic car insurance was often a nightmare um, the, in terms of the stuff that goes on in underwriting and the cases that you see and, of course, the cases where things go wrong and they're not, you know, all of a sudden you've got this really weird scenario that involves a car and, I don't know, a cow and maybe some chickens and there's just nothing in the rule book for what has just taken place and this person wants their money back. And then all of a sudden, you're faced with uh, so-called cyber insurance, and there's not really been a, a test case, I don't think, where someone, uh, A, a major incident happened, B, the company at the heart of this major incident admitted publicly, oh my God, something happened to all our stuff, because most people don't admit when something bad happens unless it's this huge breach and every, everybody and their uncle knows that they're in this data dump somewhere. So uh, in terms of, you know, until we see something like that happen and then we see exactly how much got paid out, um, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of theoretical ifs, buts and maybes, especially as some of this involves, you know, it's not like if I, if I go out and crash my car in, in the country that I live in and I'm insured in that country and the insurance covers it, it's, it's not really the same thing. You, you might have a data breach with, mm -hmm. that involves a server in this country, the hacker was in that country, the insurance company is based over here. I mean, it's just, there's too many variables and I, I'm, I'm not massively optimistic that so-called cyber insurance is going to take off in a major way, or at least in a way that, that you know, repays the person that paid for the insurance anytime soon. It's Do you agree, Chris, that if it were made mandatory, that it may actually be, for many organizations, money that ends up being spent that would we end up being spent where it might better be spent on prevention in the first place. Yeah, I, I tend to agree at the moment, definitely. Uh, if, if you came to me and said, okay, you can spend this ridiculous amount of money on this insurance that may not pay out, there's a whole bunch of uh, clauses and variables in the, and there will be, because there always is, from you know the point where the underwriter sits down and drafts up the rules to the, the, the poor person on the phone in the call center that gets told, all of our stuff just went missing, what do we do? Um, yeah, I, I would personally, at the moment, throw all of the money at the, the security tools, the people running the tools, the training for the people. I'd be kind of reticent uh, to, to spend big money on cyber insurance. But so, I, I have a perspective on that. The, uh, if it was made mandatory, and I'm not saying whether or not it should or shouldn't be, uh, it would likely be paid from a different budget line from the one that comes for cyber security or for information security, whichever area actually looks after the, the, the data. 
uh, it, it's kind of uh, analogous to saying that you have health and safety insurance to protect against something, you know, box falling on somebody, uh, but then you wouldn't actually take steps to protect against it. I don't think anybody would suggest that would be the case. So if cyber insurance was mandated, I think organizations would find it to just add to their bottom line effectively and start doing it. But to answer your question directly, um, and to talk about the analogy used about the car, I think there's, there's two points to that. There's one in terms of the blame for your insurance. Yes, because you said to your insurance provider, you have a control that you would put in place, you lock the car, they would see it as your fault that it was lost. I think, and don't quote me because I'm not a solicitor, I think from a legal perspective, it's not your fault that your car was stolen, that's the fault of the criminal. But in terms of regulations, GDPR is coming out, and we, we're, we're talking very almost exclusively about uh, personal identifiable data. Well, uh, that, that has now uh, been published in the European Journal and will come into law in May 2018. So that will see fines levied against an organization up to a maximum of 4% of their, their global turnover. So for an organization like M&S, let's just say that was us, we have 10.7 billion turnover globally. That's somewhere in the region of about 400 million pound fine as a maximum. So that focuses our attention very, very succinctly. And we were already very concerned about um, the customer data and protecting against the threats. But in, in many cases, what GDPR, GDPR has done has taken it to the very top level of the board. Because up until now, the Data Protection Act, which is what we used to use to ensure that data was protected proportionately, had a maximum fine associated of £500,000. Now, if you imagine the public sector organization, the Information Commissioner's Office, was tasked with then enforcing that, there, in, in terms of what's in the public best interest, the maximum they could get as a fine would be £500,000 compared to what the legal team of an organization could spend to protect their brand. That's no longer the case. The maximum they can get is 4% of global turnover. In terms, if you like, the win condition the Information Commissioner's Office now has, it's much higher. So I think they are much more likely to start actively pursuing those organizations that are adopting bad practice when it comes to protecting data. So to answer, you know, are there any regulations or standards out there? Regulations, general data protection regulations, now applied relatively equally across the European Union and then applied to those, uh, those countries outside the EU where the organization operates within the EU is absolutely an example of a very good government-led uh, piece of uh, regulation and legislation in this country. Uh, responsibility and now insurance. Responsibility, of course, is an interesting one. I shall leave you all to go home and look up what vicarious responsibility is, something that uh, mixes with this. Uh, any more questions from the floor? Yes, madam. Uh, can, uh, okay, well, we'll t t take you next, but I think somebody's already, somebody's already got, grabbed the microphone. Sorry, hello. Um, you mentioned Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus, and at the moment we hear an awful lot of fear, uncertainty and doubts from the industry that there's an inevitability of a breach. Does Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus go far enough to actually mitigate a breach, in your opinion? Uh, let, let me be selfish. I've got the chair, therefore I have control, a bit of a control freak. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually tell you... Well, Cyber Essentials is a starting point. Uh, I've been around for, for a while. Uh, I was around when uh, we started with the 7799. Never mind the standards, never mind the numbers. These are good ideas to do. This is stuff to be done to try and prevent things happening. If things do happen, there are other recommended practices you can do to try and get back from somewhere. Now, I pointed out that the panel, oh, sorry, this panel and this session is about the future of cybersecurity. And I'm going to use the opportunity of sitting in this chair to give a personal opinion. Cyber Essentials is great. Cyber Essentials is brilliant. It gives you five basic things to start with. Yeah, of course it doesn't include everything. If you wanted to try and put everything in, on together that you ought to do. Uh, you'd start with a blank piece of paper, we'd all gather around, write something down, we'd all walk away with something like 27001 all over again. It's what we know about at the moment. At the moment, our approach to cyber security is all predicated on sticking plasters. It's putting right poorly developed products. We have very little, I mentioned the word trustworthy. Uh, anybody heard of the trustworthy software framework? Nobody, oh, one, oh, one hand went up, uh, one hand, hand, hand up. Anybody involved in product, soft, product development which contains large elements of software? Anybody sell stuff which has software in it? Nobody, 
wow, that is amazing. I'm fascinated to know what products and services you actually run and sell out there if there's, uh, if there's no software in it. But uh, the five cybersecurity essentials are basic building blocks. What we need to do is to turn this round and actually develop products right in the first place. Let's, if we're going to talk standards, actually, let's go back to 9001. I'm not talking about you know, getting certificates. I'm talking about good practices. Being bothered about being able to operate, being able to deliver and to deliver in such a state, such a compromised state, that actually we can't wait to clear things up. We are going to have to work while the bad guys are on our networks because we've outsourced so much of that to the internet and our service providers. Okay, I've just gone off on one. Anybody else, anybody like to uh, bring me back down to earth? I think uh, it's a bit like, say, PCI DSS when that came out for the payment card industry. A lot of people looked at him, well, that's so basic, but so the way I see programs like Cyber Essentials, it's sort of like looking at yourself in the mirror in the morning and thinking, okay, I'm responsible for some stuff, let me take it seriously. It's sort of, if you can't do the basics, then you really have to get those right first. So that in the future, we need to be in a position where we're not faced with making the excuse like Talk Talk did, where they famously said after the breach, well, the law doesn't require us to encrypt our data, therefore we didn't, therefore it got stolen, so we haven't done anything wrong. And the ICO, my understanding, has taken the opinion in the light of that breach to say it doesn't matter whether what the law says about encryption, we recognize that it's a strong technology that could have helped. So if you have a massive data breach and you hadn't taken that as a useful step, then you're going to have more explaining to do. And that's the way that I that I see that these starting points for people who aren't sure whether they're in the right place yet, if you don't get the basics right, then you're definitely got, not going to get the details right as well. So you may as well start where it counts. And the idea is that if everybody does that, then we all lift our game a little bit, and then applying the fancy and new spangled stuff is much easier for all of us because we don't have a few people letting the side down. Yeah, and, I, and, and if I, you need a step between Cyber Essentials and 27001, look at the Small Business Scheme, IASME. That's well, very well suited. Um, I'm sorry, cut you off in your prime because you didn't have a microphone. Uh, you, st uh, you have a microphone, but it's not switched on. It's possibly on. Ah. Right. So you covered some of my question already, I think, because we've talked about suppliers and we've talked about customers, but um, as an IT manager and somebody that looks after my mum's computer, you know, what's uh, perennially annoying is that people like Adobe, you know, can like pump flush out there, and it's broken every single week. And how is that? Be fair, only once a month. Sorry, once <laughs> once a month is enough. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, you know, why is there no regulation about that? You know, why is that still allowed to happen? You know? uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think you can realistically, you can't really regulate. Um, people's updates of programs. I mean, every, every, I mean, to some degree, everything is going to be broken somewhere. Um, in, oh, yeah, no, I mean, I mean it, it would, it's just one of those things, I think, how, how you would actually sit down and draft up this framework where, okay, these, these companies here need to make sure that this is going to work, that's going to work, that's not going to be broken. That's, and again, a lot of these patches, to be fair, are, are responses to uh, really, really clever, sophisticated zero-day threats and attacks that nobody realistically could have thought, oh, in, in three weeks' time, someone's going to come out with this that's going to subvert my program in this way, that's going to break that thing and hijack that machine. I mean, in, in going back to that question about the basics to some degree, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to explain to people about the basics, why they're important, why these things are, you know, good things to do. Um, like, I, I used to work for a company that dealt with so-called APT, Advanced Persistent Threat uh, Attacks. And, you know, nine times out of ten, a lot of these APTs were just really stupid, basic things. Like, one of the biggest and first um, APT attacks that hit, I can't remember which company it was for the life of me, but it involved uh, lots of money lost, lots of company data spilled everywhere, and someone assumed that it was, um, it, was, it, was, it was down to one of these patches for, you know, a company had, put out a, uh, had to put out a patch, they didn't, they had to update the software, and they got in that way. And it turned out that actually the way that these guys got in was uh, they, I think it was the, the intern or like someone in the back room somewhere had gone into a, uh, the recycle bin, gone, oh, that Excel document shouldn't be in there, that, that's an official, you know, that's a... a 
a, a receipt for something, clicked it, and you know that basically blew up their entire network. And Chris, I think you're, I think you're overcomplicating it. I feel your pain. Who's going to stop Flash? Because you don't need it. We know you don't need it because anyone who's got an iPhone or an Android hasn't had it iPhone ever Android for years. Who's going to stop it? We are. When we reach out on our naked security site and say, try giving up Flash, the response we get is people say, oh, but, but like the BBC's website requires it to watch their stuff. Well, stop going to the BBC's website then. In other words, we can be the very, very armchair home activists if we want and say, OK, I'm going to take my business elsewhere. When, when a threat gets to the size that it's small enough that we don't need to put ourselves at the risk, we collectively can make sure that we don't even need a technological solution by just saying, sorry, I'm not going there. Find another way to do it. That's my opinion. Yeah. Paul's, that Paul's absolutely right. The state of technology, it's your mum's fault for buying it. And yours. And yours and mine. We do it all the time. We reward the first to market. We never reward the people who might take the time to design and test in the trustworthy systems in the first place. Who else has managed to grab the microphone? Over there. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Bo I came from Indonesia. I uh, just want to ask about the cyber jurisdiction and cyber sovereignty practice in UK. How about the government here protect and govern the cyber life of their citizen, and then uh, is there any discussion about cyber borders or cyber territory? Perhaps. Thank you. Mm. Who would like to start there? Uh, I'll start actually. I think one of the things we're, we're talking about now, quite quite a lot, is what what can we do to stop the cyber attacks? And whilst we're working within that paradigm, we're working within a paradigm whereby the, the hacker or the person doing the thing actually has all of the control because they're looking for weak points. And the one thing I can say about pretty much every, every system is there will be a, a weak point somewhere. It's just a matter of time before that's found. So yeah, we could stop using Flash. We could stop using any other vendor. I won't mention anything else, but it's just Flash because it's been mentioned. But eventually, that new thing will have, have something that found that, that's caused a weakness in it. Instead, perhaps what we could do in terms of what the government could do to help us is they could change the pattern completely. It could change the paradigm. So that the data that the criminals are after, the credit card numbers, the, the person identified with data, we can make it useless to them. The reason why credit card numbers are so useful at the moment is because it's a 40-year-old technology. All you've got to do is get hold of that pan and the four digits at the, at the back, well, sorry, three digits at the back, and the, and the expiry date, and you've got a credit card yourself. You can just remake it. You can even go and get a hotel key card and put it on there with the right software which you can buy freely on the internet. So maybe we fix that first. And maybe that's where the government should focus their efforts on, is fixing that to make sure that's secure, so that that thing that we use to transact money can't be stolen and used against us in the, in the, in the modern world. Maybe we could do the same thing with uh, personal identifiable data. If you think that the reason why this is important is because with your mother's details, you can uh, get access and apply for a mortgage or apply for a loan, a same-day payment loan. You can just put the details in there, and they verify you online, job done and then they've got the money. That's what the criminals want to do, so let's take that away from them. Let's find some way of already uh, securing your loan application that doesn't involve something that is, quite frankly, freely available on the internet anyway, without needing to steal it. 192.com, have you heard of that? You can get access to people's birth records, death records, where they've lived, their, their previous history, and you can use that straight away yourself if you felt, felt the need to. So what I suggest the government looks at is ways of changing the game so that the hackers have to do something completely different. Because at the moment, they're all spun up on getting access to your credit card details. They're spun up on getting access to your personal identifiable details. If we make that useless to them, in many cases, we just remove their, their reward benefit. Well, uh, well even, even uh, I mean, uh, just to follow on from there, um, you know, the, the, the 192.com, how many people um, are f even familiar with taking themselves off the, the full uh, the electoral role, you know, when you get the voting thing through and it, there's a tiny little tick box. They've actually had to make it a lot more uh, clear in recent years because so many people were ending up on what is effectively a gigantic marketing dump list. Mm. Uh, you know, you get the thing through. I live here. I want to vote. Uh, and it, 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 there's always some ambiguous wording or it's not entirely clear if you're supposed to tick it or not tick it in terms of, no, I don't want to be on the full electoral role. And then people wonder why they're getting all this marketing spam through, why they're on all of these publicly available databases. And 
And, you know, again, in terms of talking about these old busted technologies that we really should fix, um, I'm sorry, we're going back to your mum again, but, um, <laughs> you, know, even, you know, there's a lot of complaints about the Internet of Things, and this is vulnerable, and that's vulnerable, and oh, oh no, you know, Company X is making a home security system, look how easily we can break into this, and then you think, oh, okay, but I mean, yeah, the, the home security system, the all-new singing and dancing security system that your mum might have installed might have this online vulnerability that allows the really clever hacker guy to come into your house and steal all the stuff. But as, you know, as anyone with any experience, even basic experience with door locks will tell you, you know, um, yeah, a bobby pin or a, a couple of dedicated tools that you can pick up from all over the place. And you know, that, that nice secure door lock on your front door that's protecting all of your stuff is at least as vulnerable as this really nifty Internet of Things device that is now responsible for all of your security in your house, if not more so. Um, and, you know, it's the same with, with credit cards and electoral rolls and all these things that sort of made sense at the time but maybe aren't quite so fit for purpose now. Mm -hmm. And we're sort of rushing to go, oh my God, all these new technologies are insecure, we need to fix this, we need to remove that, we need to get rid of that one. And say, so, okay, we've still got all of these other things that we, we need to really sit down and have a think about before we try and band-aid all of this other stuff. It's interesting, of course, because within the next few weeks, well, next month, if there aren't any political things which might distract it, uh, the government is poised to uh, publish its second national cyber security strategy. So I, for one, uh, having been turned down with the idea that we should have a way of, find, of devaluing data um, uh, in the first one, will look, be looking to see uh, whether that's moved, uh, moved on. The, the first policy has given us a weight uh, if you measure it in terms of, you know, never mind the quality, feel the width, a lot has been done uh, in terms of giving us an infrastructure to do stuff about this. Question is, is will cyber security policy 2.0 actually take us forward into implementing it? Uh, who has control of the mic? Do we have any other questions? Do we have any other questions? Yeah, one, just w one more at the back. whether they thought uh, biometrics had a role in devaluing our data or otherwise protecting the data that can't be otherwise devalued. Uh, well, just before I pass that down the panel, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try and break up the pattern, give Lee a little bit of a break. Uh, we'll, we'll, ask, we'll ask Paul first. Uh, I can give a case history, a okay, case study, of uh, one of my auditor colleagues who was looking at a, at a tax office, uh, saw a pile of laptops in the corner and said, oh, I can see you're on the improvement uh, scheme. You're, you're upgrading those to have fingerprint readers. And they said, no, we're taking the fingerprint readers off them after one of our officers had his laptop stolen and they came back for the thumb. Paul. I, I, in terms of, I, I think I get what, the, the, what you're saying, this idea of devaluing data. In other words, that we stop relying on letting things like your birthday or your mother's maiden name, uh, if you even know what it was, actually have some kind of meaning. Uh, and one of the problems with birthday as any kind of identifier is A, everyone knows what it is pretty much or can find out, and B, you can't easily change it. Uh, and that leads us to the position that when we go onto Facebook or all these different social media sites, what a lot of us probably do is we have lots of different birthdays. And then we have to keep track of all this false information that we've knowingly given, which puts us in a mess with terms and conditions. My own concern about biometrics is that they are, that for years and years and years, the latest thing, it was in the 90s, it was retina scans. Well, we've gone away from those. I don't know whether it's to do with getting conjunctivitis off the lens or something. And then it was going to be fingerprints, but it turns out that if you melt down some, if you boil up some gummy bears, you can get around that. And, you know, then there's going to be skull resonance and there's going to be iris scans and all this kind of stuff. What worries me is that concern that some kind of a hash, some kind of an identifier is being collected, possibly shared, of an attribute about you that you can never change. Yeah. So my own opinion is that a simpler way, even if it's not quite as secure, that is secure enough, that controls your and the person you're giving the data to liability well enough, is probably better if it's something that we can give up on in the future if we find it doesn't work. And what worries me about biometrics is that it's all about attributes that you can never change. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of um, biometrics, um, 
the, my big problem with everything from the retina scans to the biometrics to whatever the next wacky thing is they come up with, it, it, unfortunately, none of it is really for our convenience or our benefit. It's for theirs. It's for either your governments or whatever authority needs this info. They, you're, you're just sort of you know, the... the, the, the I don't know what you would really call yourself, but basically you're not that important in the overall scheme of things. As long as they get that data, that's what they want. And more often than not, that data is bundled in with a bunch of more traditional stuff that you know it's supposed to replace, but it never does. Like I, I uh, apply for things like visas on a regular basis. I applied for one not long ago. And in addition to all of the biometrics and the thumbprints and the everything else, you, find, you think, well, OK. Um, oh, now they still need five years' worth of email correspondence printed out, not just titles of emails, but the, the content of who you're talking to. They want uh, photographs from however many years it is. They want uh, records of call logs, chat logs, Skype chats, texts, um, Skype phone call records, how long the phone calls were. I mean, basically, it's, it's pretty much your entire life in this bundle of paper that the, you really don't want getting lost on a train on a USB stick. Once that leaves me, it goes to a third party. The third party checks it all. Then from them, it goes to whatever official government agency wants it for, for what you're either applying for or want to do. And you think, well, where are they going to store it? They don't tell me because that's not part of the process I'm applying for, so they don't care. They're not going to tell me where it gets kept. They're not going to tell me how long it's kept for. They're not going to tell me how long someone's got access to five years worth of my, you know, my life effectively in this bundle of emails. And now it's tied to fingerprints, it's tied to scans, it's tied to the info on my passport that is, by the way, incredibly easy to change um, and tamper with if you're of that mindset. Again. Again. And, you know, it's like, okay, where, where is this going to turn up? When am I going to find out that all of this stuff was left on a train somewhere? Because inevitably it always is. So I, I don't like that we're having all of these really permanent bits of data attached to some case files somewhere with all of this potentially changeable info on us, but, but then it's really identifiable and it's, you know, it's really personal stuff that we're, we're paying a lot of money to give to a third party that gives to a government agency somewhere. And it's like, well, what happens to it? I don't know. When is it going to be destroyed? I've no idea. What do they actually do with this? <clears throat> and I, I don't, I'm not keen on it myself because it's, it's really, it, it's good for informing your government or whoever that you're not a threat because of X, Y, and Z. But to me personally, it's, it's no benefit. And in some ways, it's actually a problem and a headache, um, unfortunately. But there we go. Leah, final thought on this? Yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, we agree on something. I'm shocked. <laughs> uh, I don't think biometrics is the answer because it is too permanent. Uh, it, it's something that defines you uh, by you being you, something that very nature is very difficult to change without surgery. Uh, and even that in itself, you can't really change things like your thumbprint or your, uh, your retina. So I think if we were to start to rely on that, it may provide a short-term solution uh, to help identify the person that's asking mm -hmm. for the loan or for the, for the payment and transactions to go through, but longer term, it's just going to provide another problem, a problem that will be infinitely worse, in my opinion, than, than the, the transient data that you can change. Uh, because you can change your birth date on, on the form that you put in, for example. Something needs to be done. I genuinely don't know what that is. Uh, but right now, I look forward into the future where we're going with technology and the requirements and why that technology exists in the first place. And I don't really think anybody's really shaken up that pot and said, let's completely think outside the box here. Let's find something completely new and a, a very unusual way of identifying you that we can change at will if we need to. Some form of central repository that is appropriately protected, and if it does become compromised, we just move somewhere else. That I haven't seen in the marketplace, certainly not successfully, but I think truly that's what we need, not biometrics. I agree, because if you think about it, the closest thing that your car has to biometrics is its number plate. And if you're happy with the way that automatic number plate recognition and the data is used in the UK, well, you jolly well shouldn't be. Who would have thought the idea, hey, let's catch people who don't pay their, their road tax. Let's catch people who aren't insured. Let's people who flee from accidents. I bet you didn't think that one of the primary uses of this car biometrics would be for car park enforcement. Mm. Yeah, so maybe that's the future of technology, to make sure we can all park. And the car analogy goes on, because the basics we've talked about, uh, the, 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 car, the cyber MOT of cyber essentials, interesting that that was raised. Uh, we've talked about responsibility, uh, getting towards trustworthy 
technology, cross-border opportunities, devaluing the data, and uh, finally we were talking about, uh, well, maybe we need to uh, either change the technology or possibly change the detail. So interesting about what we're grappling with, because here we are talking about the future of cyber, uh, and I thought it was all going to be about robotics, artificial intelligence, and blockchains. So what do I know? I'd just like to thank you very much, <laughs> to or send my thanks to the panel, so if you'd just like to show the, your appreciation for their time. And uh, we thank you for your attention too, thank you.